Welcome into the Blurred Wire. Today we are discussing Furiosa, a Mad Max saga, with my wonderful co-host, Ty, who is um, kind of doing like a Doctor Who face regeneration type of thing right now. <laughs> yes, I have reverted back from being a man in his mid-twenties to being a teenager once more. Completely switched forms. You know, I've been on a bit of a Doctor Who high, so I had to like get that in there. But um, yeah, how how's it feel to kind of to be clean sh- to join the clean shaven again? If I did not have to do it for work reasons, I would not have done it. I no. grew a beard for a reason. Uh, I guess the question is, do you think you're going to grow it back faster this time, or because I mean, you grew it pretty fast last time. I hope so. I heard that. I've heard that shaving it and then growing it back it can come in softer Mm -hmm. and a little bit fuller so we'll see i i would love for it to come in softer because the mid-length period is where it gets real bristly and that's the most uncomfortable because i have very sensitive skin yeah partly why i don't like shaving is because it it hurts to shave but Uh, when it grows out it eventually it became really like soft and fun to play with (laughs) uh and i mean it's got to be otherwise what's the point well you know what's the point what's um so anyway contrary to popular belief i mean contrary to what it might seem we are not talking about beards today we are talking about furiosa a mad max saga that just dropped in theaters this memorial day weekend um and i guess we'll talk more about box office in a little bit but like it feels like it's not even the summer blockbuster movie. Like it doesn't feel like Memorial Day weekend because we don't have that blockbuster in theaters. You know what I mean? Like it's mm-hmm. it's just been so slow. Like the last movie to do well was Dune Part Two, and it was released back in March. And I'm like, I'm almost like, imagine how well it would have done if they pushed it to Memorial Day weekend. Because mm-hmm. you know that was like to like kick off the summer, like it might have been, it might have done insanely well. But again, we'll never know because it got pushed back because of the strikes, and it was supposed to come out last year. But anyway, right. going on to Mad Max Saga, which of course stars Chris Hemsworth and Anya Taylor Joy. Anya Taylor Joy is taking over the role of Furiosa from Charlie Theron, who played the role in the critically acclaimed Mad Max Fury Road. So I guess we'll start right there. How do you feel about Anya Taylor-Joy's performance in the movie? And how did she take on the role of Furiosa? Such an iconic, um, you know, role. Such an iconic action heroine role. Stellar. I I never doubted for one second that Anya Taylor-Joy wouldn't do a great job. Mm -hmm. But this movie just, it really represented what I think she's great at bringing to the table. And it's something that she has talked a lot about, like personally, uh, about feminine rage, how often women are resorted to like suffering and in, in silence or or having resorting in movies to to crying or being sad and not really representative of anger and an outward like violent expression of it. And I think Anya Taylor-Joy really tapped into that sentiment because she absolutely kills in this role, both people and the acting roles. (laughs) Exactly, exactly. And I feel like Anya Taylor-Joy was the perfect cast for it because she plays a lot of unorthodox roles, a lot of, you know, not straightforward, like in the world of Mad Max that's so weird and so kind of crazy She's mm-hmm. the perfect actress to portray Furiosa in that world. Same way why she's she'll be perfect as Aaliyah Atreides once we get Dune Messiah, you know, hopefully if that's the direction that Denis Villeneuve continues to go in. Um, but I think that's why she she really helped bring it to life. And yeah, I didn't see any kind of drop off or anything. I felt like we were still getting to experience what it was like with Charlie Theron. Um, mm-hmm. And I know you and I talked about it a little bit right after the movie. I think my only thing is I wasn't expecting her to be in like half the movie because mm-hmm. and maybe it was a little bit more than that. But like, obviously, massive spoiler alert. First of all, if you're watching any of these videos, they're probably going to have spoilers. Sometimes we try to do them spoiler free, but more than often they don't end up being. But just in case you got to this point and you still want to see it, and I definitely think you should. Go see That's it. The spoilers coming out. Yes, go see it. And if that means you have to turn off this podcast right now so you can go watch it and then come back to it, 
That is perfectly fine. Stop listening to us. Go watch Furiosa because we are about to spoil it very, very hard. But uh, I say all that to say, yeah, she was, I'm not going to say barely in it, but she was only in it for like half of the movie. And like I was talking to you too because I was like, I kind of like it because they told, because like a lot of times when they do origin stories, especially like with Captain Marvel or they put the actor if they're doing origin stories back from like someone's birth they'll put the main actor in like the first scene the star of the movie and then they'll kind of tell their origin story through flashbacks and usually i hate that i think it's dumb because i'm like these flashbacks are stupid it kind of like can take you out of the movie i'd rather just see the linear timeline and show them growing up that way i can see how they grew up will affect their actions as they get older right However, after watching this movie, I'm like, I almost kind of understand, like, the flashback, like, the reason why people do it that way, because we're halfway through the movie, and I'm like, where's Anya Taylor-Joy? And, like, for the ha- like for the first half of the movie, it feels like Dementis' movie, like, we're watching Dementis, a Mad Max saga, because, again, Anya Taylor-Joy is a child, and she doesn't talk very much, and we're kind of watching the story of how she ended up going from the green place of many mothers to Dementis's biker gang to end up being in the Citadel with a Morton Joe. So we kind of need all of that, but I see why people do it with the flashbacks because they could have started the movie with Anya Taylor-Joy and like interperse those scenes in between. Um, but again, it, it probably would have been the same amount of screen time, but you wouldn't have walked away feeling like, she was in the, only in it for half of the movie, you know what I mean? But at the same time, it still was, um, she still did an excellent performance. Um, like I said, the only thing I have to say is I, I kind of wish we got more. Yeah, I think the time that she is in the movie is is incredible and it's stellar. And I think I think it was a decision that it feels like George Miller was way more concerned with with setting up the stakes for her uh because there's not a lot of there's not a lot of dialogue especially Mm -hmm. from Furiosa in this movie and so you know George Miller especially with Fury Road he took a very show don't tell uh philosophy to the film and it's something that I think he's really succeeded with both Fury Road and now Furiosa a show don't tell because we get to see a lot of emotion just through the choices that people are making uh, in the beginning, like with the opening sequence with uh, Alila Brown, uh, her performance as mm-hmm. a young Furiosa and and her mother tracking Furiosa down for days to find these bandits. There's so much of what's told about the, the scarcity, how important their their green land is and how much she cares for Furiosa so all without dialogue. And I think scenes like that wouldn't work so much in a in a flashback. That would be way too jarring to have a a present day Furiosa to then cut back to a before Furiosa. So it's a it's a choice that he wanted to to make and and I totally get I totally buy into Furiosa's revenge and her desire mm-hmm. for revenge by the end. Yeah, especially because she had watched um, you know, Dementis kill her mother in a horrific fashion. Um <clears throat> so it does create a a, a pretty powerful storyline. Um I love how um Chris Hemsworth came back, not came back. I love how Chris Hemsworth was cast as Dementis um because he's an Australian actor. And George Miller is an Australian director, and this is supposed to take place in Australia. So it really, really feels like the roots are being explored here. Same thing with, um, I think, the mother, whose name is... It's escaping me right now. But the mother of Furiosa, she's also an Australian actress. And she was just in that, you know, rom-com that was, that came out at the end of last year, Anyone But You. Um, and so I kind of like it. It feels like it brings a lot more authenticity. Um, and like, I felt like Dementis's performance, Chris Hemsworth's performance as Dementis, I thought it was spot on. 
Um, and I think the only thing I think from the trailers, it kind of looked like he was going to be like a little bit more demented, for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, because I think, but I think like you didn't watch a whole lot of the trailers, which I I kind of think will help with this movie because a lot of the trailers show you a lot of the action, a lot of Anya Taylor Joy scenes, and a lot of Dementis's crazy scenes. Because he's not he's not like super crazy the entire movie. Like he has some like crazy, like weird moments. Um, but it's not like that's him throughout the entire film. So you kind of with the trailers, you kind of end up expecting a lot a little bit more. And again, I don't know if that's the way the trailer was designed to like kind of hook people in. I'm not really sure. Maybe that's just part of, you know, watching a trailer, which can happen. Sometimes trailers can ruin a movie. Um and I don't think it ruined it in this case. I think it just set expectations slightly different from when you actually got to the theater. Um, Cause you know, it still is action packed, but I wouldn't call it the same like breakneck pace that Fury Road mm-hmm. was. Cause Fury Road was like breakneck, like um, nonstop action was what it kind of felt like. And right. for this movie, they, you know, he had a story to tell I think it's also partially with the prequel too, like with Mad Max Fury Road, since he's telling a story that's kind of happens in the present, he can just skip right to the action and just let everything else kind of fill in as he's just like telling the story while everything's blowing up around you. But with Furiosa, Mm -hmm. you know, he has to establish, okay, what is the green place? How did she get here? Why does she want to kill Dementis? How did she end up in the Citadel? How did she end up in the period as an imperial term? I can't even say the word. Imperi- my, I'm Pretorium. totally messing up. Yes. <laughs> yes. Oh, my God. Anyway, how did she end up as that? There's a lot of questions that you kind of got to answer, which is why it kind of has to take a more narrative format rather than a more action-packed format. Absolutely. But I think if you think of it that way, I think he really, he really packs a lot in for as much time as he has to fill Mm -hmm. the runtime which what was it like two two and a half hours honestly it didn't even feel like two and a half when i was watching it it felt like it moved much quicker than than that but he covers a lot of ground in it and and he covers it really well Mm -hmm. i think with his storytelling technique that like and and definitely it doesn't feel like there's no action in the film because there is absolutely tons of action it just doesn't feel like you mentioned as yeah the pace is a little slower at times but i think with that slower pace you get you get more intimate moments even if they're brief like very mm-hmm. very nice like the the scene with furiosa and praetorian jack where they just have a, it's a very quick scene but they just have a moment where it feels like since she was a little girl that's like the first person she has found that she can actually bond and connect with and is not uh, bad crap crazy right yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> and then and then even even little things like like little looks here and there from her. A, another testament to Anya Taylor Joy as an actress. Like she spends a lot of the movie with her, the lower half of her face covered up, and she has such expressive eyes that she does so much acting with in this film mm-hmm. that she doesn't even need half of her face because she can communicate so much just through her eyes, whether it's taking in information, whether it's aggression, whether it's this this fiery passion, she's communicating or this this like intense like burning hatred or rage. She communicates all of it with her eyes and it's just a absolutely stunning performance. I agree. And I think it was and it was very interesting some of the other um actor choices that he used cuz like we got Angus Simpson returned as the organic mechanic mm-hmm. from Fury Road and we saw how he was originally with the biker gang and ended up in the Citadel mm-hmm. but then with um and I think Nathan Jones I think he played I don't know if he played him in Mad Max um Fury Road as, yeah no as he did. Rictus. Mm-hmm. so he played Rictus 
<clears throat> and of course, in Mad Max Fury Road, he ends up dying. But this is set before then, so he comes back as Rictus, which kind of sets a lot of continuity. I believe he did. Yeah, he did yeah. play him in Fury Road. Yeah, he did. Um, but then Josh Hellman came back, but as Scrotus mm -hmm. instead of Slit, which, um, you know, I think Josh Hellman is just such a good actor. Um, George Miller wanted to have him in the movie. But like the whole movie, I was like, why does Slit look so different? Or like, like I was confused because I thought it was the same character. Because again, like you can kind of do it, and like it won't really notice. Like um, in the MCU, Gemma Khan plays um, Minerva in Captain Marvel, but then she comes back and plays Cersei in um, uh, in Eternals. Um, mm -hmm. But like, it's one of those things where you don't really know unless you like look at the casting and see that Gemma Khan is playing two different roles even though it's like technically in the same universe because as minerva she has all this makeup on she's blue like you, you just can't really tell it just it looks very different but like josh mm -hmm. hellman has a very distinctive face and a distinctive smile so i was like the whole time i was like is he scrot like i didn't know that he was scrotus i thought he was a war boy in the other movie so that mm -hmm. was um and then, of course, now I'm looking at the cast and I'm like, oh, so he was just playing two different characters in it. But again, he has such a distinctive face, like as much as I know George Miller probably wanted to bring him back. And he probably wasn't thinking about that. I I don't know if I would have made him slit or scrotus or something like that. I don't really know what I would have done, because, again, he's a fantastic actor. I understand wanting to have him in the movie, but he does look like like, again, that smile. It's like it's hard to to separate it in a different in a different vein. <laughs> But yeah, he did look a little different, but again, it's mm -hmm. it's the face. You can't you can't you can't get away from that. So, so how did you feel about oh go ahead? Go ahead, go ahead. You had a better question than I did. <laughs> I was gonna say how how did you feel about um about having a Morton Joe back as a like secondary antagonist in this movie? It was kind of interesting and it kind of made the film a little uh, pretty layered i think i'm almost like like seeing dementis's rise to power was important too so we kind of understood that but at the same time i don't know it's hard to explain because like i feel like a part of the movie again because this was a narrative driven movie wasn't an action driven movie but mm -hmm. as we got through the movie basically dementis tries to attack the citadel he gets turned away and pretty much destroyed. So then he goes and takes over Gastown, which are really, which is with a really smart Trojan horse kind of strategy too. I, I got to give him props for that. That was that was clever um, to take over Gastown. <clears throat> but then he ends up um, like he gets in a conflict with these other citadels, and then he ends up going into a forty days war with a Morton Joe. And I'm mm -hmm. like, I almost. I don't know. I feel like, and like that part, they kind of show like in montage. And I'm like, again, if it was me, like I almost would have done the movie, told it through the lens of the 40, of the 40 year war and not done a whole lot of flashbacks, but like, I probably still would have started the movie the same way, but I think I would have just shot straight to the 40 day war with Anya Taylor joy, seeing her fight not side by side with Praetor and Jack for Mo Morton Joe. Oh, and then we find out that she's trying to find him through this 40 day war. Like she's trying to find Dementis while killing all these bikers through this 40 day war conflict. And then eventually she ends up finding him towards the end. And then we kind of fill in the pieces of her story as we get there. And like, we see the war rig and everything. And again, it's not like a huge, huge thing that I think like brings down the story necessarily. I just like, once they brought that up, I was like, oh, I think that's something I would have wanted to see. And I you feel like see, you love to see action. You just want to always see action. I do. I do. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm an action guy. That's why I love yeah. Mad Max Fury Road. Like, you know, uh, but I, and I think like the narrative still could have been um, told. I think you still could have got the story, but like by setting it in the what's the best way to put it it's almost like you don't really have to set up the action if it's in like a 40 day war scenario like if it's in the war scene you can like have an action scene with a lot of war and then go to like a flashback or a calm down scene 
and then immediately get back into the action of the war. You know what I mean? You don't have to like build it up every time, if that makes sense. Like, like when they were going to take over Gastown, you know, he kind of had mm-hmm. to build up the action and like put all the stuff on him. But like when you're in a war, it's like the next scene, if it's a battle, like it just makes sense. We don't really have to see how the battle starts. I think that's what I mean. Like you don't have to see how do we get to this point where they're fighting. We already know it's in a war. So you just show us battle after battle to kind of keep the the action going. Sure. But I do think it made sense how Mortis and Dementis were... I didn't even think he was going to have a Morton Joe in this movie, which is why I was really surprised to see him in the trailers, because I thought Dementis was going to be like a Morton Joe's predecessor or something. Um, and I feel like having a Morton Joe was was helpful. I don't think I really got how... Because, like, obviously Furiosa doesn't like a Morton Joe. Um because he's mm-hmm. a terrible person. Like, we all understand that. And that's why she viciously killed him in Fury War Road. Um, <laughs> but it feels more like, like, remember at the end of Fury Road where she was like, remember me? And then she like, you know, rips off his face and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Based upon Furiosa, like, I remember seeing that and like, it didn't really, like, it was just awesome because we all wanted to see him die. And she killed him in a really cool way. But we didn't really think about, like, what did she mean by remember me? And to me, Furiosa, like, kind of was, like, the way to explain that. Because, like, that sounds like a very personal line. Like, she's not just killing someone who's a terrible person of these five girls. She's killing someone that she personally feels victimized by. And Mm -hmm. she kind of was by Morton Joe because of the way that he, like, ruled everything. Like, everybody who lived there was victimized. But it didn't really feel quite as personal if that makes sense like i was kind of expecting like maybe she spent time as one of his wives and was able to escape and realize she needed to get those other wives out of there something like that um but that's not really how it ended up going um and so like i said i don't know if his his appearance didn't it definitely didn't bring down the movie having him in there i don't think it made it worse in any way and i think it did make it better i just don't think it made it as good as i thought it was going to be because you were wanting a more personal interaction between him and Furiosa. Yeah, something a little bit. It just kind of feels like he's another warlord that she ends up, and then she kind of ends up using him to uh, get her goal, which, again, makes perfect sense. And again, he's obviously not a good guy, so, like, his death was very justified in Mad Max. But the the line that she said, like I said, that personal, like, remember me? And then, like, Mm -hmm. ripped off his face. Like, obviously, that makes a lot of sense for Dementis, because... He didn't see her after she left and he killed her mom. So she's obviously very, very upset by that. And it's very, very personal. It doesn't feel as personal with her and a Morton Joe. But Mm -hmm. like I said, maybe she took on um, the pain that those girls, you know, his wives had and was like saying, remember me. I mean, do you interpret that line to mean anything deeper or like it just didn't end up or. Well, well, I'd say a couple of things. Um, first, I want to make a comment back to the the forty war point oh, yeah, yeah. that you were talking about. Um, I think that would absolutely make sense if the focus was an action driven narrative. But I mm-hmm. truly do not think that's what this movie is. Like at its core, fundamentally, it is, and it feels like we've been talking a lot about these kinds of films recently. It is a revenge story. It is it is Furiosa trying to kill Dementus mm-hmm. and get to him. And focusing on the war would take away from her from her her hunt of Dementus because she wasn't even there in the war. She was back in the citadel the entire time healing mm-hmm. from her arm being ripped yeah. off. Um, yeah in a so very you... in a very br- and well the arm ripping off wasn't brutal but just like the implication of it is so yeah. like hardcore um but do you think that would have taken away from the hunt like sorry to interrupt, but like do you think it would have taken away even if she was like if we saw her like using the war to get to him like killing all these bikers and being like where's dementis where's dementis yes. where's dement you still okay Yes, because I think every everything in the movie always comes back one way or the other to Furiosa getting to Dementis. Mm-hmm. That's why we don't get as much about the Immortan Joe part, because we only see Immortan Joe as much as it is relevant to that journey. 
we see him at the beginning because Dementis comes in with his biker gang out in the front and challenges Immortan Joe for his throne, gets sent back, and then comes up with a ruse in which Immortan Joe then tries to take possession of Furiosa. And we only see him within the context of that revenge plot because we don't have scenes that flash back to just Immortan Joe and plotting because he's not relevant to the story being told. The 40-day war, by proxy, is not relevant to the story that's being told here. It's not relevant to her revenge. She wants to kill Dementis. She couldn't care less about how Immortan Joe makes out in this war or how the rest of his biker gang is. She just wants that man dead whatsoever and to get back home. If she can, with the people she cares about, like with Praetorian Jack, a person that she had come to respect and deeply care for, um, mm -hmm. he doesn't make it in a very in a very sad, sad way, a very sad uh, scene. He doesn't make it. So she treks out for her revenge mm -hmm. at the hands of the man who caused it. So I think any focus away, and that's something that I've been thinking more about since I've seen it, is how tight the movie feels in that sense because like looking back it doesn't feel like we have much fat in that way all of the beginning even before before we get to the Anya Taylor Joy portion when it's uh Alila Brown portraying Furiosa it is very focused in just showing us how horrible Dementus is as well as establishing the how do we get here because I do think by pro by it being a prequel, there is some groundwork that has to be laid as to how certain characters get to certain points beforehand. But I think he does a good way at doing that while also making it still service the revenge. Yeah, I think that makes sense. And yeah, I, I, I kind of agree. Um, see how that would have played out. I think just... And partially, I think it's like the summer blockbuster talking, you know. Yeah, like the, the... you just what you want like action. Blah, 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 blah. Like, this yeah. is this is what this is what May is for. That's that's what we get in May. And, and I like, think, and I think that's totally valid because this this almost in some ways doesn't feel like a follow up to Fury Road because it's not like I don't think the draw for this movie is the same draw for Fury Road. Mm -hmm. as as much as i love it like an action led movie i don't think this is the action is incredible but at the end of the day when i think back on it i will go back to watch it for the action but if i had to pick between the two and i just want to watch just pure action i'm gonna pick fury road i'm gonna go to this movie for how it weaves that in with a compelling revenge narrative and I think it's the combination of those two, like that that braid of these two threads being weaved together is what makes Furiosa feel unique and have its own identity for being a prequel, but also different. Mm -hmm. And I agree. And so so do you think that that line, um, remember me, is kind of like, what do you think it means in Fury Road after watching Furiosa and realizing she doesn't really have that much of a personal connection to a Morton Joe. Does it just kind of like, just like not really matter or like, how, how do you react to it? Like, I don't think, I don't see it as necessarily something directly hurtful that a Morton Joe did directly to Furiosa in a physical sense. I think it's just the fact that she's been forced by the circumstance to be under his control being sold up because i mean he made hot we may not have had a scene where she was attacked by a morton joe or something but he literally used her as property and like took her in as property and he uses women as property in mm -hmm. this film i don't think like to me that is reason enough for her like that's justification for whatever feeling she comes away with of remember me yeah, because obviously of, yeah like i don't think anything and if anything i think i'm glad that they didn't go down the route uh for having furiosa essayed at any point there was a 
brief period where I was afraid they were going to go that route with that scene with Rictus, where he's like playing with her hair. And oh, he goes yeah, in. Yeah, yeah. I was very worried they were going to go that because I, I hate mm-hmm. that trope of requiring women go through that to then be strong heroines. It's way overused and horribly misrepresentative of of yeah. any, either side of it. Um, and I'm glad they didn't because that would have, I think, taken away from yeah. on, uh, Furiosa's character here. And I think when we got to that scene, like with Rictus, even like what I was expecting when she became one of the wives, because at first he was like, you'll grow up here and then you'll become a wife. I thought that um, I didn't think we I think I thought she was going to escape that before Rictus. I mean, before or more in Joe tries to like basically get her pregnant. Like I thought because based upon the way we saw Mad Max saga, I mean, the way the way that Fury Road was done, I would have thought that like she would have grown up there with the wives. And I thought that was going to kind of be her personal connection. But I guess it does kind of make more sense that she grew up more working on the rigs and stuff because that's how she got Mm -hmm. so good with them. And -hmm. like maybe I thought she was going to escape like I would have thought that she grew up to be Anya Taylor-Joy and then maybe escaped and like worked on the rigs for like 10 years or so until she got to the point where she was fighting in the 40-year war or working on the rig or something like that. But either way, when we, I know what you mean. It was kind of nerve-wracking when we got to that scene with Rictus, but at the same time, I was like, I mean, it's George Miller, though. I was like, I don't really mm-hmm. think, I, I like, something's going to happen, but I don't think it's going to be, like, the trope of, because, again, that's just kind of what, like, I feel like George Miller, like, in any other movie, I would have been nervous, but I feel like with George Miller, um, based upon what I have saw in Fury Road, I was like, I don't think he's going to show, I think she's going to end up. And by the time I was having the thought, she escaped. So it was yeah. like, she yeah, has, it was like yeah, scene she, over. Because that's very close to like before we get to Anya Taylor-Joy. Yeah. Because then she starts, she starts working on the, I don't know if they're ever given a name, but like the people that walk on the big hamster, like the inverted hamster wheel where the people are like climbing like eternally. She worked as one of those for a bit. And then, oh yeah, I guess. And then she got promoted to was it was it like working the the crank i forget I exactly yes because he just pushed the, the other guy off the gloves yeah she yeah. got the dude's gloves but yeah yeah so she kind of just worked her way up into that into that role but no i think i think her whole like childhood and being raised in that environment into adulthood to me is reason enough for the remember me because also at by that point she is a prominent figure in a Morton Joe's um like like uh I'm trying to think of the the right word, but like the function of mm-hmm. his system like requires having her a very trusted and um very prominent figure in like the economy of his like civilization because she is the one that's trusted to run the tanker for supplies without her no one else no one else gets anything so Mm -hmm. it's like she does play a very prominent figure so yeah i can i can see it yeah and i think that all and i think that that really makes sense for the storyline but of course like we talked about how like you know i'm a very big action guy and Mm -hmm. um you know the movie has a lot of action don't get me wrong i would still classify as an action movie but I think based upon Mad Max and the trailers, it's not quite as much action that I think a lot of people were expecting. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, it wasn't as much as I was expecting. Oh my God, there is a Def- guy just walking on the railroad tracks right now. And I really hope he's okay. I'm sorry, that was very random, but like out my window, I'm in the city and I can see the railroad tracks. Uh-huh. And I'm like, do I need to call? Okay, he's getting off. He's getting off? I think so. Okay. Sorry, guys. Ooh, perks of living in the city. Okay, okay, he got off. Okay. He'll be okay. If you can, if you can, if you're listening to this railroad man, we hope you're safe and... Hope you're okay. Please get off the railroad. There's their sidewalks. Don't get hit by a train because they will not stop and will not be able to see you. Anyway... What was I talking about? 
the um, box office box office you're getting to that yes yeah so even though fury road it kind of um like you said this movie doesn't really seem like it has as much action as like if you're basing it off of the trailers and you're basing it off of the movie that came before it you're not going to get as much action as expected and i'm wondering if that's kind of affecting the box office performance because from memorial day weekend which is usually one of the biggest weekends for movies. That's kind of the coveted weekend. That's the weekend that Marvel has dominated for the past 14 years. Usually they do it at the beginning of May. Sometimes they do it Memorial Day weekend. It just kind of depends. But usually the Marvel movie that's in theaters is dominating through Memorial Day weekend. Um, And I'm wondering, and so far, May 2024 itself has pretty much been a 2024 and 2023 have been some of the worst movies as far as box office returns. I won't mm-hmm. say performance because I think there probably have been worse movies with performance, but with inflation, with budgets going up, and with how that kind of all tracks out, I think it's two of the worst years we've ever had, worse than 2022. Um And 2020, you can't really count because of the pandemic. And 2021, everyone was so excited to be back in theaters. But like Fury Road right now, it's barely at 70 million. And it barely beat out Garfield for the number one spot at the box office this weekend, which is not good. Like, I think the projections were it was supposed to hit. I don't know what it was projected to hit. Let me see what the... um, um, the opening day, I think it was projected to hit what it took the entire weekend to hit. Um, because it opened to 32 million, and at the end of the weekend, right now it's setting at 70 million. And this is the lowest box office takings on Memorial Day weekend since 1995. Sure. 1995. And I feel like at this point in the film industry, in the movie industry, like critics and they like we can't just say it's a fluke it's a um just a happenstance you know what i mean like Mm -hmm. there's a reason for it so what do you think it is i i can't i can't in good it's it definitely is not the movie i really do not believe it is anything to do with furiosa i mean the general the general uh audience reception has been very good the critical reception has been very good um by those kind of like corporate metrics the movie should be doing much better than it is um i think i think it has more to do with a symptom of people's movie going habits i mean when movie when it is like twenty dollars for a single person to go see Mm -hmm. a single movie like you can't expect the crazy kind of numbers that you would see otherwise um and it makes things like like oppenheimer or uh or barbie or dune or bobbenheimer of course it makes it more you have to look at like other areas so i don't i honestly don't know for context for context, Garfield got largely negative reviews from films, from critics um, all over. Guess mm-hmm. how much his box office has taken in? 80. 100 million. Oh my god. Its budget but, was 60 million. But let me ask you this. What other movies for Memorial Day weekend were kid-friendly? Yep. If like... If exactly. like if the logic is just like if that's like the movie going weekend and you got a family like what other option do you have yeah exactly <laughs> it's like, who's going to bring their 6 year old to furiosa yeah no please, please do not bring your 6 year old to this movie and i also think like the rise of streaming content and all of that has really kind of affected it cuz like i don't know if i was a parent and like garfield and furiosa were coming out I'd probably be like, okay, I'm going to go take my wife to go see Furiosa because there's only two of us. And we'll just wait till Garfield comes out on DVD and then we'll just go see it then. But clearly Mm -hmm. that's not the way that comes out on streaming at some point. And we'll just go see it then. 
but it's not really the way that people are thinking. And I think, I mean, and again, I don't have like kids pestering me to like go to the movie theater. So I don't really know what that's like. I remember pestering my dad to take me to the theater back when I was a kid, but I don't know what it's like to be on the other side. So I think it's just the rise of streaming as well, because mm -hmm. even Dune Part 2 is already on HBO Max. The the Fall Guy that came out weeks ago is yes. already is mm -hmm. already available for for purchase to stream right and i don't think and for some people like you can rent the movie and watch it from home for like four bucks i'm not gonna rent the fall guy i'm just gonna wait till it comes out on some other streaming platform that i'm already paying 10 bucks a month to have but i think with the industry right now like executives especially with the way netflix blew up and i think everyone that's trying to chase netflix's success is completely um is what's kind of ruining almost the movie landscape itself because mm -hmm. everybody now wants to have their own streaming service so they can have people paying for that but the problem is people aren't going to pay for 10 15 streaming services and then also go buy a movie ticket because now you're kind of approaching like you it's like and like a bunch of i heard like a bunch of streaming services were coming together to like make a package and someone was like online he's like all the streaming services are going to come together and be offered by a company and we're going to have cable again. Yep. Because at, at one point people did pay for a cable and they would go yeah. to the movie. Stream, streaming was the answer to cable. Right, right. Streaming was supposed to compete with cable, but I think right now it's ended up competing with the box office because especially with, you know, being able to watch whatever you want on demand, um, it changes a lot. And I think with Dune, and Barbenheimer, like, I think in order to get someone to come see your movie in theater, you kind of have to make them feel like it's not going to be the same if you watch it at home. And that's what they did with Oppenheimer, Barbie, and Dune Part 2. But other than that, no other movie has really done well at the box office in the past two years. The one that comes closest is Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3. And a lot of that's because it has a lot of fans from Guardians 1 and 2 all before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, so I think the pandemic has definitely shifted people's moving going, movie going habits. Um, I think Disney has yet to pull a profit on Disney Plus, like with all the content that they've been putting out onto it. Um, they still haven't pulled a profit. And I think that's partially why Quantumania did so poorly. I think that's partially why... Um, the Marvels did so poorly because people were like, well, I pay 10, I could pay 10 bucks a month and I'm just going to go see it when it comes out on streaming. And I don't really need to go to the theater to go see it. You know what I mean? Like, and also back when like the Marvel Cinematic Universe was like really, really at its peak, you know, to see a movie in theaters on TV back when cable was a thing, it would take years, like, like years. Like I remember being so excited when I got to watch the Avengers on like TNT and it was like 2015 and it was like the first time they were showing it. So it was like, mm -hmm. if you didn't see Avengers in theaters, you weren't going to see it. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's kind of an effect on it too. I think Furiosa is going to be out on HBO max probably before the summer's over. I would say before Dune prophecy comes out. And I might like I'm probably gonna cancel my Max right now because I don't use it, and I'm just gonna sign up when Dune Prophecy and Furiosa comes on it, <laughs> just for that month, so I can just watch the stuff moment. I want to watch. Because that's the way that it's headed. So, um, it's very I, like I said, I think Furiosa is still a good movie. I think it's still a great movie to see in theaters. Um, but also like it's true, like when you're watching a movie in theaters, you do kind of want to see a lot of. A lot of bang, 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 bang action. And I think it has a chance to rebound. But the fact that Garfield is beating it by $30 million right now is not good. See, but I I think I did. there's so much action in this movie, especially from what trailers I have seen of this movie. That's mm -hmm. all that they are showing. Yeah. All they are showing is that action. So, like, everything on paper should should be making this a a success in mm -hmm. that way like this is this is worthy of a action blockbuster i don't know how much around it is supporting it how many other 
blockbuster type movies we have as an option but well again the crazy thing is like when you think about dune part two which has been the i would dare to say the only successful movie that's come out in theaters this year successful turned in a nice profit margin um because even 700 million is kind of like like when your budget's 200 million 700 million is kind of the benchmark that you have to hit almost which is that which can i just take a second to say how stupid that is that you have to make 700 million just for it to be considered successful yeah that's that is ridiculous movies cost too much movies cost too much too much to make yeah i mean when they made um when they made mad max fury road you know it grossed 380 million and that was respectable but that wasn't a, a a hit. The movie only got greenlit for a sequel because of all the critical acclaim. And people were like, oh my God, we loved it. But it didn't do that well in theaters. Because again, it made back, like, you know, studios want to like triple their budgets. And when you've got your CEO making like $5 million, you know, you can't have your movie uh, just barely making its budget back. Of course, of course not. Yeah, not not with not with those salaries. So um because like doing part two capitalism is a cancer, man. It's gonna kill us all. I like I agree that Furiosa is like I would say Furiosa has more action than Dune Part Two. Hundred percent. But which one did we go see? Like, would you go see Furiosa in theaters again? Yes. You would? If if I had like if I had like the ability like if you're talking just like a choice. Like, I would absolutely go see it if, like, financially I could afford to <laughs> continually go and see this movie. Okay. Absolutely, I would, because right. I loved it. It was right. great. It was everything I enjoyed from Fury Road condensed onto a smaller scale with more with more personal stakes. And I love that. But are you going to go see it again? Probably not. Yeah, and I mean that's just a state of, but like, but that's part but two, that's not, but that's not the movie. That's like my no, no, no. Like, I don't think that's the movie either. I think it's just the way it was marketed. Like again, after I saw Dune Part Two, I was like, there is no way I'm not gonna go see this again in theaters. Even if I end up selling my kidney, I'm gonna end up seeing it. And again, like that level, like you shouldn't have to have like that level of critical acclaim for your movie to even be a success. Like Furiosa deserves to be a success in theaters. My point is, it's just the way that the marketing's going. Like if you don't make audiences feel like they're going to miss out on something incredible unless they go see this movie in theaters, it just kind of ends up flopping. But then like you, I mean, Furiosa is, I'm checking it right now. On Rotten Tomatoes, it is at a ninety for both right. for both That's critical great. and and audience scores. Like no, not every movie can be the like transcendent movie of the decade. Right, kind of but movie. it feels like and for That's that what to me the stakes is. Mm-hmm. But like at that point, that's not any film's fault. That's not Garfield's no. fault. That's not Furiosa's fault. That's that's the industry, and that's that's probably have to do with a lot of the the ceos who are trying to push and push for the profit portion i think a lot of it is is streaming too because again with the barbenheimer phenomenon people felt like this is a transcendent experience that i'm gonna miss out on if i don't see it in theaters there's no way to get this back with dune part two same thing those like you like if you didn't see it in imax you felt like you were missing out you know what i mean like but unless you create and are able and it's like how do you create that kind of marketing hype i don't really know and there are some movies that still have done well like anyone but you came out in the at the end of last year and it grossed a very healthy 150 million on like uh um i think it was and it was mainly because of word of mouth like the opening weekend was kind of shaky but people really liked it and they went back to see it however the difference is Anyone but you cost like ten million dollars. The budget, if anyone but you had Furiosa's budget, it still wouldn't have even made it back. Like it was considered a success because it made one hundred fifty million. Furiosa's budget is one hundred sixty-five million. Mm-hmm. So it's like when you have these blockbusters, it's just like I said. I think the issue right now why people aren't going to theaters is streaming. It's a lot more comfortable in your home. 
Um, like I have a neighbor, I had a neighbor next door who used to have like a literal movie theater room where we used to watch football games. And I'm like, if I still live next door to him and I was able to go over the way that I could all the time, I'm like, and we had access to streaming. I don't know what movie, but I mean, I still love going to the theaters because I just love the experience. And I feel like you can't get that sound, you know, anywhere else. But mm-hmm. for a lot of people, it's just kind of like, why when I can just watch it at home? So, oh, sorry. Um, I think it's very interesting. I think it's very sad because I think movie theater going is a very big um, part of the industry. Mm-hmm. I think being in a theater is it's a huge part of movie theater culture. Um, like, you know, moments that I've got from seeing Spider-Man No Way Home in theater, uh, Infinity War, Endgame in theater. Like, those are moments that I'm never going to forget. And I feel like you kind of need that. But like, especially with like big franchises and stuff, like look at how many big franchises flopped last year too. Like Transformers didn't do so well. Mission Mm -hmm. Impossible, it did all right, but it didn't do what it was expected to do. Mm -hmm. Fast and Furious 10, which I don't even know how they got to 10. Don't know how they got to 10 movies about about whatever they're making. Come on, those are just schlocky action. I I know. I know, and I've seen them all. all, It should feel like it should be all over for you, man. Like, that should be, like, your bread and butter. There's only so, I guess there's only so much schlocky action without plot (laughs) I could really justify. But that movie made, like, 700 million. However, Mm -hmm. its budget was $365 million, which means Mm -hmm. at 700 million, it just broke even. They, they were counting on like a billion dollar like i feel like almost like especially after marvel got like i think like six or seven almost billion dollar movies in a row was it that many because black panther was a billion captain marvel was a billion infinity war was a billion ant-man and the wasp wasn't um and then endgame well infinity war was two billion and endgame was like two billion so like mm-hmm. in two years marvel literally made like six billion dollars off of like four movies Mm -hmm. and i think after then it kind of changed the scope to like almost like a billion dollars is kind of like like i think executives think like oh yeah we'll hit a billion dollars and it's like will you because that's that's very very different so i think because when you look back to like our childhood there were a lot more like there was more room for success for smaller scale movie, like B movies, like things that were just kind of schlocky, but that you could just go to a movie theater and see. And there are way smarter people who have done way better analysis of this online that you can go and check out, but to just mm-hmm. echo their voice slowly, the industry has cut away the ability for us to have that room for like, like okay movies and slowly it just creeps keeps creeping up and up to where now it feels like we can't even have really good or great movies because the room for how how success is is measured is just so astronomically high that it feels like the only room for barely successful in movies is to have like once in a generation kind of films the things that the things that are going to be oscar worthy you know Mm -hmm. big air quotes for that but but things like an oppenheimer are what it takes for it to be successful and that's just sad because we're going to lose out on so many unique films in the process things are going to be homogenized so much to be as successful as possible i mean i've already i've read a couple of articles already that furiosa's poor performance could lead to the planned mad max the wasteland movie that george miller was working on to be canned because Mm -hmm. i've seen multiple interviews where or multiple articles where he says that it kind of depends on the success of furiosa and it has nothing to do with his ability or his team's ability or the actor's ability on set it's none of their fault because they made a killer movie but because it didn't hit this absurdly high threshold for success that the industry has deemed as necessary we're going to lose out 
on a continuation of this crazy, unique, and to me, a breath of fresh air for the landscape that it occupies in the film industry. We're just, we could lose that out entirely. It used to be that, you know, talking about a movie made you go viral, right? But now it's like a movie almost needs to go viral for it to be successful. Like mm -hmm. if people aren't talking about it before it comes out, people won't end up seeing it. Now, like, and again, the standard used to be that like, like back when Marvel movies were coming out in 2017, 2018, and I know I keep ref ref referencing those, but like every video on YouTube, they were all about theories, all about breakdowns. People were talking about the movie because they wanted to be on the hype train because everyone was taught they, they wanted to be on it. And it, it felt like the movie was the thing that was making them popular, right? Because they had like a good breakdown of Avengers, people started following them because the movie talking about it is what made them popular. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, especially in 2023, it's completely shifted because like, again, if you didn't have people saying like, wow, I just realized Oppenheimer is like this gritty R rated thriller about a bomb going about you know the atomic bomb and then you have barbie which is like this happy bright movie about about barbie and it's like i think i want to see those back to back and then suddenly mm -hmm. that just becomes viral and like the executives are like works for us i guess that's fine and people just end up wanting to go see it because the talk around it went viral like it wasn't anything about the movie itself I mean, those are both good movies, don't get me wrong, but like people got excited for them before they were out in theaters mm -hmm. because the the narrative around them was going viral rather than like the movie. Like, it, it's so hard to explain, but it's like, it's almost like instead of like movies need social media now. In order to right, be but that successful. but that was that was lightning in a bottle. Like that wasn't because mm -hmm. gen like some genius marketers came out came up with that yeah a collective a collective group of people just independently thought it was funny that this super serious yeah. world war ii dramatic christopher nolan movie came out the same day as barbie it's it, it was a meme and and companies thought they could capitalize it and they thought that that should be the standard yep and and like i said to me like it kind of worked with dune part two because there's a lot of people talking about it um, but there's also a lot of actors in it, you know, um, and, and I think that kind of helps too. I just, I'm like, when we go through, because again, as streaming prices continue to climb, like, you know, I had to switch to Netflix with ads because when I first, first got Netflix, it was like eight bucks. And suddenly I look up and it's like charging me 20 bucks. And I'm like, I had to go down to Netflix with ads and still pay mm -hmm. for it. And we don't, and, and we like, can't share it anymore because they locked right. out on the ability to share accounts. And I'm like, really, Netflix? Like, you guys are losing money right now, really, really. Um, but you know, whatever. Very anti consumer. I know. Um, and I just hope. I don't know what's gonna happen. I don't know if like to me, it's like it can't, it can't keep going like this because like if the ticket prices start rising to account for the failing box office returns again, people are going to stop going. And if the streaming prices start to account for the, start to go up because people aren't tuning in as much or they're not making enough money, because I don't think there's a single streaming service out there that's making a profit except for Netflix because Netflix started it and everybody else is trying to catch up and fill their categories, fill their catalogs with content for people. But Netflix is the only one and like we like when, when they stopped the sharing, I was like, no, we're not doing Netflix for a whole year. And my wife was like, we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> we need Netflix back. <laughs> and now we have it back because basically because she said so. Um, mm -hmm. But again, like if those keep climbing, it's just going to lead to some kind of huge crash because people aren't going to keep spending money on something that gets more expensive. Either you'll right. be a theater person or you'll just be a one one streaming service kind of person. Like, you're not going to keep paying for all of these. And I just hope, like, again, the the typical, like, I don't want to say capitalist response, but the capitalist response to see, like, the way the shift is going is like, oh, well, we just got to raise prices so we can bring in more money. But mm -hmm. that's not going to help because the raised prices are why you're not bringing in more money. 
because mm-hmm. again box office movie tickets um you know like i remember when i could go see a movie for like it was pretty much 10 bucks and you know you would go for like the five dollar tuesdays which i still do um but you know movie ticket was pretty much like 10 bucks and now it's like especially if you're going at a busy time like on a weekend night like i'm almost afraid to have a bunch of people like come out to a weekend or invite a family because your ticket's gonna be 18 bucks Mm -hmm. to go see a movie if you got a family of four that is literally dinner at a fancy restaurant like and where before like it felt like we could i could afford to say yeah i want to go see furiosa but then like i'm also going to go see like garfield with my parents yeah whatever you know it's like i could you know it could make more financial sense to where like yeah we can go like we can go everywhere and part of that is like movie tickets raising so where we have to be way more selective like there has been a ton of movies that have been coming out recently that i've been really wanting to see that i just have because of my own personal like budgeting reasons i haven't been able to like say hey that's you know that's a fiscally responsible thing for me to do because i have to be more selective so i have to wait out for the big things the the things that i have absolutely have to see because mm-hmm. there's no way I was not going to see Furiosa. There was just absolutely yeah. no way I wasn't going to see this because I loved Fury Road so much, and you know, for that to for that to inhibit it, like yeah, absolutely, it's what's going to keep me from seeing this multiple times at the theater. It's what's yeah. going to keep me from seeing other movies. So, yeah, it's a sad state of affairs. I mean, at least now you can write off all those movies as like uh, tax write offs because yes, you know we have it to was talk a about them. Expense. Yeah, it's a business expense at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, but like, like again, like, and I, I like seeing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. If I wasn't going to cover it on the podcast, would I have still gone see it in theaters? I don't know. I don't think I would have. I don't know. Yeah, I I wanted to see in like Godzilla versus Kong. That was Godzilla and Kong. That was one I really wanted to see in theaters because I thought mm-hmm. it was going to be like, you know, crazy action. But it's like they just they didn't have the budget to give me like a theater. Like it almost feels like the movies that you need to see in theaters almost need to be a little bit different than the ones that we get on streaming. Because for me to want to go watch it in theaters, I need it to be you know, like intense action almost the entire way through. And I think, and I think it's also sad because like we've also gotten, I don't know if like, I don't think the quality of the film industry is necessarily like gone down a whole lot, but I think in the middle of all this inflation, we've had a lot of bad movies come out, a lot of really bad blockbusters that have kind of made people like kind of shy away. Like I feel like movies like Thor, Love and Thunder, like that was one of the most disappointing movie theater experiences i've ever had and that was one of the so much so much it made me want to be like where's my money back i want a refund and Mm. i see for a lot of people it's probably like like for some people that movie could have turned them off to the whole disney franchise and just been like you know what i have disney plus already because i have verizon i'm just gonna wait for it to come out and that way if it's stupid i can just turn it off instead of sitting in this theater and having to watch the whole stupid thing because it was so stupid and i think that's part of it too like you know the like people aren't just gonna because again like 10 years ago if you couldn't stream it i mean yeah i've been to theaters and i've seen bad movies and you didn't come out feeling as like this was such a waste of time and money when you weren't paying for streaming now again 10 years ago i wasn't really had like bills or anything so maybe that's different too um like you know, my parents were the ones like with all the bills so uh maybe that's a different but i think that's kind of affected it too like i can't really think of another movie in 2022 that was like a huge disappointment um but like with quantum mania a lot of people were disappointed my brother actually liked that movie but a lot of people were disappointed with it and i think that definitely didn't help mm-hmm. and i think just you're it gonna see awful movie yeah and i think i hated just... it hated <laughs> very very much so yeah i just i just such a big missed opportunity to it it, that's what it just feels like to me um and but again and like you and i saw like um spider-man no way home together and that was a fantastic experience right like i loved it and people were saying like like that movie was built for theaters because like you could tell like even when andrew garfield came in and he was like 
like breathing weirdly. Like mm-hmm. when there's no one clapping in the theaters, like, okay, it looks a little weird. But the yeah. whole point was so that way you could have the people and like that was a theater experience movie. But Ooh. like mm-hmm. Black Widow was a huge, like I I hated that one. And it, it like I said, when you get all these duds in between, um, it makes people just not want to go see movies. I mean, like Transformers Rise of the Beasts, I still enjoyed seeing it in theaters. It wasn't a good movie, but a lot of stuff blew up, a lot of things got shot. And that's what you want <laughs> in your movie. Um, but like, and look at all the DC movies that flat that flopped, you know? Mm-hmm. I'm surprised that. And like, I think the saddest part about all of this that we're looking at is that we know the people that are going to feel the effects are not the executives in the ivory towers making the profits. Like, it's mm-hmm. either going to hurt the actors, it's going to hurt the writers, the cameramen, the people, even the fans, the consumers. Like, somehow... Whatever happens in the industry, I feel like they're not going to be the ones to take the hit. They're not going to be like, well, since uh, everything's like kind of changing with inflation, maybe I should cut myself from, um, you know, $30 million a year and just bring in 25. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> that's not going to happen. That's not how they think. Nope. So, um, no, nope, because yeah, their their profit is set in stone from the beginning. It's, yeah. it's everyone else's problem to to make it that point. Yeah, and it's like, well, just go make movies yourself, man. <laughs> like, that's going to be their reaction to it. So, um, kind of sad. It's kind of like a, this is like the saddest we've ended an episode because I'm like lamenting. To, to I bring think it back just for a moment. Yeah. Furiosa is definitely worth your time to see. Yeah. As a, as a rapid fire, Chris, Chris Hemsworth is so great as Dementis. Mm-hmm. I think it showed a lot more range than i was expecting from this role i think him being thor has really kind of uh locked him into a bubble that i forget sometimes that he's like an actor yeah and it felt like he was acting a little bit more nothing Mm -hmm. crazy but he really he really fit into the role and it felt like he was having a blast yeah it really Uh, did anya taylor drew every all the actors were firing on all cylinders it really felt like everyone was firing on all cylinders yeah. The only thing that I think I was disappointed by at times was it wasn't as practical as Fury Road was. There were moments where you could really see, of course, there was a CGI in Fury Road, but mm-hmm. the moments of CGI in this movie felt way more jarring than they had in Fury Road, whereas it felt like with Fury Road, the CGI just helped amplify the practical effects that were being shown. In Furiosa, it feels like the CGI was just kind of bad CGI at times. Yeah. And it wasn't enough to completely distract from the movie. I think the action scenes still hit really hard. And there's plenty of practical vehicular combat carnage to enjoy. If you're like me. But it just does not, it just does not quite stack up. Mm-hmm. But I think that George Miller proves that his style works on a smaller scale. Like it, like the secret sauce to Fury Road was not just the fact that it was this giant caravan of cars. That was great for that movie, but I think his skill still worked here when it was smaller. Yeah. And I mean, like, again... I completely understand like inflation is absolutely insane right now and it's so hard to go see movies. Um, But if anything is worth your time and money, I would say Furiosa, you know, AMC theaters. I think every theater pretty much has a $6 night regal AMC epic sign up for movie pass or something. I use my movie pass to get a six dollar ticket and a, and a bag of Reese's. It is great. It only cost me 10 bucks a month. Um, So yeah, because I mean, like I said, I, I love the theater. I, I hope the industry doesn't die, but I, we've seen more losses in recent years than I can ever imagine. And I think Furiosa does not deserve to be one of those movies on the ash heap. Like there's a lot of movies last year that deserve to be box office bombs. Flash kind of deserved to be one. You know, Shazam kind of deserved to be one. I don't know if Godzilla and Kong ended up being a box office bomb, but it pretty much deserved it. Furiosa is not one of them. 
So this is not a cash grab. This is a movie made yes. with love and care, and it is worth your time and energy if you can go see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's the perfect way to send it off. Um, and so next week we're gonna go back to the '80s, and we'll try to keep the um the hype for Furiosa going because we're gonna talk about Mad Max, the film that started it all, and. Like when I saw this movie, I didn't even know that like there was a whole franchise that came before Fury Road. So it got some very interesting thoughts. <laughs> You're already <laughs> laughing about it. But I can tell because like it's gonna be a very interesting, interesting pod. So it, it was a movie made at a different time and a different yes. style. And it's it's very it's ripe for us to talk about. Yes. But so... please let us know what you thought about Furiosa. Mm -hmm. Like Tell us if you didn't like it. Tell us if you loved it. I want to hear your thoughts. Until next time, guys. Until next time.